blockchain based AI beauty service and it's an e-commerce where um, it's basically trying to reshape the beauty industry. Okay. So right now, like maybe you buy uh, your, or your, your beauty, like cosmetics online, maybe through Amazon or maybe you go to offline store, but what this company is trying to do is, is very different. And, and as you watch this, we're going to watch a video, just a quick at, uh, commercial of this company. But then um, when you look at this company, remember the slide that Eddie um, had, which was, it's not the application that's big, it's the protocol. Application is really the same. Like we just look at the same thing that we're used to. It's what's really changing is like what's underlying. So let's quickly watch the video. Wait, can you guys, can you guys hear? No. No, okay. Ooh, how do I do this? You gotta do that, right? I, I just learned today. So if, uh -huh. you go to sh if you go to share screen, like when you did that before. Yeah. So unshare screen and then do share screen. And right before you click the screen. Ah, share computer sound. Yep. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I'll do my screen for video clip. Let me know if you guys can hear it, okay? So there was not much content in there, but then let me quickly explain. Okay. So um, this company hasn't launched yet. Um, it's going to launch in the fourth quarter of this year. So this is like the website that you see, like it, it obviously um, like nobody goes there yet because it hasn't launched, but then it's like a testing site, but this is just like um, what we are used to seeing, you know, like there are products, um, there are, cleansing toner as essence, whatever, like their events, like treatments, um, community site. It's just, it's just very similar, but what makes it very different is like the underlying technology. So, um, I'm not saying like you should buy the, like, you know, stocks of this company. Uh, I'm not saying like, um, this company is going to succeed, but what I'm trying to show is that this is really taking place and changing from operations to marketing to every part of like sales, every part of the company. Okay. So in this company, there, there are two ways they generate data. So first way they generate this data is that through a wearable device. So you wear something um, like, like something that has like a sensor. Um, it senses like how your skin type, like, or tone of your skin, how dry it is, like which part of your skin is more dry and stuff like that. So it collects data through your wearable devices. And the other way is this company um, cooperates with like skin shops. Like, oh, this, by the way, this is a Korean company. So it's like, um, so they connect with like dermatologists, um, with like plastic surgeons in Korea. And uh, what they do is, um, all you do is show them, show like either skin shop or the dermatologist or the plastic surgeon, surgery um, hospital, like a QR code that has been given to you from this company. And what they do is they, um, they can enter in like your data um, using this QR code. And what, what happens is this data that has been generated is stored in the blockchain, like LFIX uh, blockchain, and it's stored there. And what do they, what do, they do with this data? Like for consumers, uh, um, usually like what happens like in Amazon, like you buy something, you look into something, you don't get anything, right? Like same thing with like Chrome browser. Um, like you look into different, all kinds of things like on YouTube or um, you, your internet activity, uh, but then you unconsciously um, get all kinds of ads 
right? But then you're, you're not really paid for it. You're not really rewarded for it. But what this company is doing is from the data that you contribute into the blockchain system, it gives you a token. So it incentivizes through token for you to um, contribute data into this like blockchain system. And, and uh, using the uh, user beauty data, um, they're trying to create like an AI expert. Okay, so um, what the AI expert does is using the big data, like the, the beauty data that has been uh, generated uh, from your contribution, they utilize machine learning, deep learning, and um, you know, based on like people who uh, purchase like similar products and like your skin tone, you know, how dry your skin is, they recommend you what kind of products are best suited for your skin type, basically. Okay, so um, uh, so here you can see how um, th these are the features, but you can see how um, it can be powerful, right? Um, it incentivizes people to not only contribute to the system, but also really get engaged and be really efficient shopper and efficient consumer because you don't have to look for every product that uh, you don't have to read like all the descriptions of the product or what does it contain, like, you know, uh, what's right for my, my own skin and stuff like that. It's just basically, it's all taken care of by the AI um, and it recommends you the perfect thing. And, and this is the personalization lecture that we've, um, we've seen like in uh, Xiao's uh, lecture in a couple, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. And, and the, the, the thing about, the thing that's different with uh, just simple personalization is that it uses blockchain. And it can be really powerful if blockchain and um, AI are combined together. Why? Because usually um, AI, when they, you know, have all the data and do their own sort of like analyst analysis, and then they present like a recommendation, but then usually there's a black box. Like you don't really know what's happening like in between, but what blockchain allows it is it really traces every single information that has been happening uh, with the AI and it, it provides the provide provides the the company with like better data okay so yeah so reward community commercial contract um beauty product uh customized shopping so um so one thing that i want you to take from this is that this is actually happening right now and and it's it's not something of like the future um and a lot of companies are adopting this technology and um, it's quite interesting to think about how two such a different, fundamentally different technologies can be combined together. So if you think about it, like uh, blockchain is a completely decentralized distributed ledger. It's decentralized, that's like the purpose. But for AI and like machine learning, what it does is it aggregates all kinds of data and centralized in a centralized system, whether it's like data center, iCloud, whatever, and um, use it for uh, centralization, but then when it's combined, like they can really help each other. Um, so, so it's changing the private sector. Next is um, I want to kind of go over the private sector and we're going to start with um, how AI is revolutionizing the government processes. More precious than gold, it cannot be bought, earned, or saved. And once it is gone, it is gone for good. It is time. Yet too much of our time is wasted. We're buried in a blizzard of paperwork, unable to do the most important work, meaningful work. This is especially true for government. Documenting and recording information consumes almost half a billion federal government person hours per year at a cost of over $16 billion in wages. But the promise of a workplace free of drudgery now rings true, even in government. Artificial intelligence is becoming a reality and it has the potential to change workflow systems forever. Our research shows that AI and automation can help government agencies free up billions of labor hours per year, time that can be refocused on more critical tasks. 
In fact, we forecast yearly federal government savings from AI to be in the hundreds of millions of person hours and billions of dollars in wages. And the fluidity of AI means customization, from automating tasks to augmenting work, making any task easier. This holds the true promise of AI, combining human and computer strengths to do work faster and smarter, even performing tasks impossible before now. Of course, with technology as powerful as AI, careful implementation is necessary. Job loss, de-skilling, and reduced worker morale are potential pitfalls that must be kept in check. But with proper implementation, AI opens up a new world of efficiency and effectiveness. Simply put, AI will help government do the work that needs to get done, so humans can focus on the work that matters. Yep. So um, that's how AI can uh, help the government. Um, I guess like for the government side, it, it also holds true in the private sector as well. But then what is really valued in the government processes and transactions is um, tr uh, uh, transparency. Oh gosh, I can't, I can't believe I was <laughs> forgetting that word. Transparency, security, and efficiency. Um, so one, another case study, uh, this is by this company called Consensus. And this company is basically helping all kinds of governments in um, um, adopting this like new technology. So what they're doing is um, they're, they're basically using the blockchain in order to uh, settle payments between banks. So the reason why central banks exist or at least like how, why we justify it is because like there are many, many transactions that happen among banks and also with the central bank and the uh, commercial bank. And um, obviously because this is, these are like financial data, like these are, these are very, very um, top security. Uh, th these are data, sorts of data that require top uh, security and um, I guess uh, efficiency. Be um, but then the, this is basically uh, what, what they're trying to do is they're uh, using this enterprise Ethereum solution um, so that they can change the South African uh, Central Reserve Bank. And um, while maintaining the transaction volume and network, while, while maintaining the transaction volume that happens so much uh, between banks every single day, uh, they're trying to make this network resilient from um, all kinds of like cyber attacks and, and things like that. So one thing that I just, you don't have to read the entire uh, thing, but then one thing that I want you to take is that this technology, usually um, when there's like a technological revolution or technological advancements, um, those things are usually, uh, ben those things usually benefited like an individual or like a specific firm or a specific nation or a group of nations, like for instance, developed nations. But one thing I just want to point out here is that this actually, as you said, as you saw, as you've seen here, it's it's affecting South African governments, and it's not it doesn't end there. It's just all throughout the nation. It's going to be global. It's going to have a global impact, and every single nation, uh, regardless of their income level, um, it's going to be affected. So um, they this the technology allows for like seventy thousand transactions in less than two hours. And that's like, that's crazy. And um, while doing that, because of because this is a blockchain uh, solution, um, it's very secure and it's, it's immune from cyber attacks. Okay, so these are uh, sorts of, so let's look at the left side of the screen first. And these are ways that um, governments are affected, like I guess programs in the government that are affected by blockchain. So we can start from like legal enforcements. You know, this is something that I, I see, I saw a uh, Korean government doing this, but what they're doing is uh, to collect criminal, uh, so collect um, evidence for like crimes. Um, they use blockchain so that it's like secure, it's not forgeable and it's very transparent um, because in, in many cases, um, these evidence uh, can be forged and can be destroyed and can be, um, I guess, changed. 
So uh, they're, do, they're trying to uh, use this blockchain system in order to um, make it more secure. And bills and payments, uh, so basically when you pay taxes or you get uh, tax transfers, or, or not tax, uh, tax returns or, or some sort of government transfers, um, they use this in, in, uh, so that uh, they can facilitate this, um, I would say, process. And it start, it's, it's, just, it's just all over at the place. Like healthcare, for instance, like if you have like Medicare, Medicaid, um, like you have, a, you have like an ID, right? Like they give you an ID if you have like uh, food, whether you're a food stamp recipient or Medicare recipient or a Medicaid recipient, any sort of government um, programs, they're trying to digitize the ID. So like your driver's license, uh, Medicare ID, like all kinds of IDs, like they're, you know, it's like filling up your wallet. But then if you have a digital ID, basically they can use one ID in order to track every single um, other ID that um, you have. And that's helping the healthcare part, um, you know, uh, welfare distribution. Yeah, this is huge because, you know, if you use smart contract, um, so, so if you have smart contract, you don't even need a person. We, we've seen uh, from Eddie's lecture last, last time, um, like you don't even need a person to operate a business, right? So in this case, one of the stigma of getting a welfare for a lot of people, at least in America, is um, when you go up to the government official, like there are so many paperwork, there are so many things that you have to be aware of. And um, it's also stigmatizing because um, yeah, you're a welfare recipient, like that's pretty shameful. But then if you have smart contract, which kind of enlists like, oh, these are the eligibilities or oh, these are the requirements in order to receive this. And if you uh, fulfill the requirements, then it just automatically disperses into your bank account, basically. Um, <clears throat> so let's read like a couple of, I guess, like the countries. Um, FDA is working on secure patient data and the Department of Homeland Security is going to use blockchain to secure border patrol sensor and camera information. Um, Chile, uh, they're, they're doing basically like they're launching energy data tracking uh, to save energy and um, they're using blockchain for processing public payments as, as I said like taxes and tax returns and um, government transfers and stuff like that. South Korea, like all kinds of stuff. Venezuela, you know, Venezuela is, uh, has been having a lot of like issues. Like there's barely any food. Like if you look at the documentary, it's pretty crazy. People are just digging um, up from the trash can, just try to find food because what happened there um, in Venezuela, what happened there was like a hyperinflation, which means like your value of the currency is just, you know, inflating just infinitely. So what, you used to cost like one dollar could cost like twenty dollars you know a couple of days from now and that's what they've been seeing and and everywhere like businesses just uh run out and and um and even in hospitals there are no napkins um no hand sanitizer or anything like that so what they're trying to do is they're trying to use this blockchain technology to create their own currency and revive the collapsing economy um, and, and as you see, uh, even like Gibraltar, I don't even know what this country is, like Isle of Man, um, like the, all these countries are just, just adopting just very quickly. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Please interrupt anytime. Can you, can you go back? Sorry. <clears throat> um, so maybe, um, maybe Eddie, if you have a perspective, you can also share. So I understand, um, you know, how uh, the data is stored in blockchain and, and that um, government is really using it for efficiency and transparency um, and even security, right? But um, I was wondering if it's, what's the perspective on like storing, let's say my text data and then make it available for everyone because I assume that there's no, you know, based on what we learned in blockchain, all these data are distributed. So the people actually will have access to like, let's say other people's, to take a look at other people's data because it's, it's out there. So is it is it okay or is there any concern when they integrate those type of information in the blockchain? 
in government sector? Yeah, so I, I, I can share some thoughts. And, and I mean, Kita is right. This stuff is being rolled out globally. Um, and every government is figuring out the best ways to play this. Uh, let's actually just take a, a real life example. I, I share this with, with uh, some of the YBOM folks, but um, uh, the U.S. government is giving like money to churches right now. And so my, uh, one of my closest friends uh, growing up, he's a pastor. They, they have less than 100 people. Uh, but his church just got $30,000 in free money. Um, and so what was that process like? Uh, it was super painful. He had to like get all these like documents together and, and like um, they had to like create these financial statements and, and do all these things. And then, and then submit it to like six different banks and the banks went to the SBA to try to like get a process. Um, but but if, if you have a blockchain based system, uh, because they file annual tax returns, then that data is already on the blockchain and it's immutable. Um, nobody can fudge the numbers or, or make fake numbers. So the government, because the data is there, <clears throat> they can be confident that, oh, we should give these guys $30,000. Imagine, imagine like the 14 churches in our region, for example, if, if there was a blockchain-based payment system that the U.S. government was using today, uh, all the financials that are uploaded annually are verified. And, and, and you can actually keep the data private. Um, what you can see on the blockchain are the public transactions, the movement of things, but the actual data itself, like how much revenue, expenses, how many pastors, all that stuff can actually be kept private. But imagine if that was up there. The moment Congress passes a law, they could immediately just transfer money um, to all the individual churches. They're actually gonna do that right now. If you look at the latest, the last spending bill that came out, um, and this is something that the lecturers have been talking about separately, but but I, I do believe that that we're on the the cusp of of uh, rolling out uh, this concept called universal basic income, um, where the government will just basically give everybody free money. Um, it's there are a bunch of economic theories that have studied this, and there's some considerations, but but it's universally thought to be beneficial, and the government's already doing it right now. They're they're trying to use the existing yeah. old banking infrastructure to get money out there, but. But if Kite and myself and Shao could, could basically create a, a, an account directly with the Federal Reserve or the government, all of our data is on there. The moment the government says, we need to give money to everybody, um, here you go. And so I think COVID is going to actually accelerate that. And, what, and what's going to also accelerate adoption is people want money. And, and in order to get that, they're going to buy into the system. You know, Microsoft envisions that as a chip that you put in your body, but I think the next step is probably everybody signing up on, on, on these platforms. That's definitely correct. I, um, so through COVID crisis, like, you know, actually universal income is the third unit that I am actually going to cover and it's, it's inevitable. Okay, so um, universal income, basically like from coronavirus, like I don't know if you, anyone uh, received the stimulus package, the $1,200 individual. If you received it, congrats, and uh, now you've become a guinea pig of the government, like, you know, for this, like, national experiment, you know? Um, like, what was thought a very socialist idea is actually taking place in the most capitalistic countries, like in Korea, Japan, um, in the United States, just giving free money to every single person. And usually uh, that process takes, like, a year or two in order to, you know, um, check up, check with like all the requirements of the, the constitution, but then now it's been, it's being passed like in a week or two because of, you know, the sense of emergency. So that's something that we will talk about in the future lecture. Um, but one thing that I do, oh, wait, hold on, chat. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, when go ahead. No, no, you go ahead first. No, no, no. Oh, is this, is this about blockchain or like? Yeah, it's, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Um, it wasn't mentioned here, but um, I'm very much interested with cryptocurrency nowadays, mm -hmm. especially Bitcoin, because of the upcoming Bitcoin halving. So I would want to ask your um, um, perspective on this, um, especially when it comes to investment. Is it wise to invest prior to the halving? Because it will be happening within this month, if I'm not mistaken, May 12. So um, in your perspective, do you think it's wise to invest 
before or after housing. Eddie, do you have any comment on that? He's, he's the expert. Um, so <clears throat> um, you're, you're absolutely right. The entire industry is focused on it. Uh, we just published an investor letter yesterday um, that gives some insight into how we're positioned around it. I think there's three different ways you could play it. Uh, most of the hedge funds in the space are taking a directional view. <clears throat> you could be bullish. Um, you could say it's bullish because they're basically cutting the inflation rate in half. And so because of that, there's there's technically uh, less supply. Uh, I think what's going on in the macroeconomic environment with every uh, government printing money kind of supports that thesis. Um, you could also think of it as bearish. So we, we talk with miners in China um, and and if you think about um, their kind of the value chain there, what they do is they basically mine the tokens and the coins and they need to immediately sell it because their, their operating costs are in cash. They have to pay electricity and pay workers. And so um, if, if there isn't price action, um, um, it's gonna create a downward spiral, spiral. You've seen this in the past where they just basically have to keep selling it and that's gonna add downward pressure. Um, or you could be neutral. Uh, I, I think I think our general view is that that it, that it is probably bullish. I think there's a reason why Bitcoin's gone up like 40% in the last like two days. Um, it's an it's it's an anticipation of that. But um, you know, like most commodity uh, currencies, um, it's it, the price action is very reflexive, and and, and so re re uh, reflexivity is this idea that George Soros came up with. Um, that price action begets price action. So if something's moving higher, there's a higher tendency for it to move higher outside of just fundamentals. And, and Bitcoin, because it's so nascent, um, uh, that's kind of what we expect. So, so I'd say like, I think you should buy it for other reasons. I think it's a, there's a store of value thesis and there's other ideas there. You know, folks are out there thinking that it's gonna hit $25,000 by the end of this year. I think, that, I think that's possible. But there's a, there's a tremendous amount of volatility. I wouldn't be surprised if, if it dropped back down to five thousand, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it went up to fifteen or twenty uh, later this month. Um, but but it's 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 completely unclear, and, and, and so um, this is not meant to be a a uh, uh, an investment uh, talk. Uh, but 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 hopefully um, everybody's focus on this increasingly globally. Like you're in the Philippines and you're looking at it. Um, there's people here in the U.S., Korea, Europe, Africa. Uh, I, I think it goes to show uh, uh, the power of these these decentralized platforms, um, and and and, the, and governments are trying to figure out how to harness some of that power as well. Thank, Thank you. I think for investment reasons, I think it always comes to um, the technology or the value itself. Um, personally speaking, uh, I think Bitcoin. In many aspects, it lacks um, a lot of like the technologies that other coins have, but um, that's just my take. I might be wrong. Um, I take it as a grain of salt. So, so, so we've seen um, how blockchain technology uh, is really changing like how we do our lives. So, not just like in the private sector and the public sector, uh, but it's just in just in everyday life. This is a fundamental technology that will change our lives and. Here uh, we see on the left, basically artificial intelligence in the future will add, you know, uh, 15.7 trillion dollars to the global economy and GDP. That's just a speculation, but number itself is not important. But what's important is it is going to really revolutionize our economy and contribute heavily into our economy and production. And here in, on the right, it says the same thing. But I just want to, I just want you to pay attention. To, oh shoot. Pay attention to labor productivity improvements will be accounted for like 55% of the entire GDP. What does what that means? Um, I'll explain later, but it basically means um, the machines that carry out the tasks that were normally in the domains of humans will be, you know, given to or will take up take you know human jobs basically. Okay, so uh, we've seen like good things about it, but at the same time, it has uh, economic impacts in our everyday uh, everyday life. And from coronavirus, we can kind of like see like the, the very 
you know, preview of it. But in the labor market, let's let's uh, get into it. Before we actually talk about like the actual impact, let's just define like what kind of labor uh, you know, or what kind of jobs there are. So you can kind of like group different jobs into four different categories. So what's manual and cognitive, that's basically like what you do with your physical body and cognitive is what you do with your brain, you know? And uh, non-routine versus routine. Routine is, is how it's defined is that in the 20th, 20th century definition, what was able to clearly set uh, the defined rules? So basically imagine you're a coder and if it's simple to define like set of rules uh, into, into your computer and you can command your computer to do it, it's routine. So basically what they, so, so basically just like simple production, like manufacturing, construction and stuff like that. Those are routine jobs um, that do the same thing over and over. Okay. Non-routine is like, there are many different kinds of situations that could arise that it's really almost impossible for you to deduce like, or, or code um, every single thing that can happen. So there's no clear defined rules. So examples could be like routine and manual labor could be anything that's like manufacturing, uh, you know, in the past um, that doesn't require electricity. So, and the routine and cognitive uh, works are just like bank tellers. Like they are white collar jobs. Uh, they, they, these are white collar jobs, but then at the same time, like these are kind of like simple, you know, to carry out. Um, Non-routine manual, the, it could be like truck drivers. Um, or it could be like janitors, um, things that require your physical labor, but then it's complicated. Uh, it, there, there are no clear set defined rules um, to command the computer to do. And at the uh, last um, is the cognitive and non-routine jobs. These are like financial analysts, um, anything, any jobs that, that require your brain um, more than your physical labor. And at the same time, there could be so many things that could arise that, um, it's hard to clearly set rules for, for instance, like, like stock market crash happens, like you, like how to act then, like, what if the stock market crash isn't like as great as it was expected, then how do you like act or like Bitcoin, how having is going to happen in a month, then like, you know, what's going to happen. Like, these are decisions that you have to make. And usually what has been non-routine and manual and cognitive like these were in the domains of human uh in the past at least but now because of big data um and machine learning these cognitive and non-routine jobs are becoming the domains of or the territories of robots as well and machines and with the advent of robotics that chanyang uh talked about and like um like recent developments in the in robotics, it's allowing a lot of and, and also AI and machine learning, it's allowing non-routine and manual jobs to be replaced by um, I guess technology. Okay, so that's like the definition of um, of like different groups of jobs. So um, we're going to talk about mainly unemployment, okay, like for for this labor market and what is going to happen uh, with uh, this like advent of uh, fundamental technologies like uh, blockchain and AI. But um, we, what we are really familiar is this, uh, this graph here, unemployment rate. But if you look at the unemployment rate, I, I just want to um, tell you why this is not a good, I guess, indicator to look at in order to see what we're about to see, which is like uh, long-term job loss in the economy. Because here, um, does anyone, uh, or like everyone's heard of like the unemployment rate, right? Like the media talks about it, um, your professor, maybe if you took econ one or just anywhere, unemployment rate pops up everywhere, but then this is only good for cyclical in unemployment. What I mean by cyclical unemployment is there are business cycles. So do you see like these like gray boxes here? Okay, so these gray boxes are recessions, like periods of recession. So this is the time uh, on the x-axis, and this is the percent of unemployment. Okay, so uh, what do you what, what's like the pattern here, like with the gray boxes? Can can someone pitch on that? Pitch in. 
So what, what kind of pattern do you see with the movement of the graph and the gray box this year? They, they, they seem to, I don't want to say they're, they're the catalyst, but they seem, they seem to precede huge spikes in, in unemployment. Right, that, that's definitely correct. So, so in the long run, like, so there are like different kinds of um, movements, but then in the gray boxes, like the unemployment rate shoots up. Like that's obvious, right? Like people lose jobs, um, like the economy goes bad, like people lose credit, uh, people lose their businesses and like all kinds of things happen. Therefore this um, unemployment rate goes up. But then if you look at the long term, like long run um, from like 1948 to 2020, like if you draw like a best fitted line, it's almost like flat. So it almost kind of tell, it tells me, wait, like in the long term, that means like unemployment hasn't really changed. Maybe like it's the same, like it, it can kind of like misdirect you in that way. And I, I so one thing, um, so let me ask some, let me ask somebody like how, what is like the requirement of being unemployed? Do you guys know? Besides not having a job, there's one more requirement, key requirement in order to be unemployed or considered unemployed. Does anyone know? The age, like if it's workable. Age is definitely important. Yeah, you have to be 16 years or older, like legally able to work. What else? Actively seeking work. Oh, there we go. That's right. So if you have been actively seeking for work in the past four weeks, then you're considered unemployed. So if you're not, yeah. Uh, so you're just out of the labor force. So, so you're not even counted as data. So when you look at the unemployment rate, it says 6%. Right. So that means like 94% of like all the adults are working. That's ridiculous. Right. Like even like you look around, like there are so many people who are unemployed, but then this number kind of makes no sense. So, so for instance, uh, what this graph doesn't capture is underemployed people. First of all, like people who, um, I guess like you have a degree in computer science at Harvard, but you're working as a, McDonald burger patty flipper, okay? Um, then you're underemployed. But this doesn't really capture that because as long as you have a part-time job and you work at least like two hours or something, you're still counted as employed. And also what this doesn't capture is the discouraged worker. So what discouraged worker means is that you've been looking for work for such a long time, for like a month or two or three months, but then you just like, lost hope because there's just no work available for you because maybe it could be because uh, you're disabled or because you um, have no, you don't have enough qualifications. Just so many reasons. Uh, there, there could be so many reasons why you could be unemployed um, or you could be a student. Like students usually don't look for work, right? Because they they have to study, especially international stu students, but this they, they're just not counted because they haven't been looking for work. So we're going to be, be cautious of using or looking at this data. So basically this is um, how you calculate, uh, whoa, sorry, unemployment rate. Uh, this is unemployed divided by employed plus unemployed. This is basically labor force here. So what we're going to look at, so instead in order to see the trend, like the structural unemployment instead of the cyclical unemployment, cyclical unemployment, as you saw, this is a great way to see it. Like, when there's a recession, how much unemployment do we have? Like if, if, we, if the economy gets better, how much can we reduce the unemployment rate so that we, which means it's, it's, it's more production because more people are working, right? So this is good for cyclical unemployment, but what we're interested in is how much job are we losing in the long term? okay? So let's look at these two. So labor first participation rate, basically. So let me explain that first. So this is um, how you calculate it is employed, number of employed people plus unemployed people. Okay, so people who have been seeking for work in the past four weeks, but weren't able to get a job and also uh, age of 16 or more. Okay, 
divided by the entire adult population. So e among everyone who can work, who are either employed or unemployed, it also, remember, it also counts the unemployed people. And if you look at the trend, um, this is from 1948 to 2000. What do you see? Like, it's like it increases. So, so more and more and more people getting jobs, even though there has been significant technological advancements. Okay. And this also happened in 1800s, but I just couldn't find like visual data. Um, it also happened in 1800s, like it kept on increasing. However, what we see recently here is from 2000 to 2020, it's just dropping, plummeting, right? There was a little bit of, um, I guess, like, uh, I guess, flattening, flattening of the curve here, but, but this is, I'll explain this part to be of is that from 1800 to 2000, uh, labor force participation rate, which means people who are working uh, with respect to the population who can work has been increasing constantly and gradually. However, in the recent age from 2000 to 2020, uh, it's been decreasing. Okay, so let's look at why that's happening. I mean, okay, so, so we're gonna look at technological unemployment and in, technolog in technological unemployment, there are two effects that are opposing effects. So simply put, Substitution effect is jobs destroyed. And capitalization effect is jobs created. Why? Substitution effect is basically technology is cheaper. Like think about like you're a, you're a, a McDonald's owner, right? And in order to hire one employee, you have to pay them not just salary, but also health benefits, un, you know, like there's so like, you know, like 501, like there's so many, okay, not, not McDonald's. Okay, because they don't get um, these benefits. Okay, let's say you're a firm work, uh, firm owner, a factory, really nice factory owner. Okay, that provides all the benefits for your employees. But like for employees, not only you have to pay them like salary every month or biweekly, but also you have to pay for their benefits, and that's actually huge. Okay, but instead, like, what if you can replace that with a machine, which is a lot cheaper? you would definitely do that. So that's the substitution effect. Like people are uh, resorting to techno technology over people. Capitalization effect is um, the effect where jobs are created as more companies enter industries where productivity is, productivity is high. Okay, so that's like ride sharing um, uh, business. I put that there because um, let's say usually before there were only traditional taxis like yellow caps, but then now because of Uber, Lyft, and all these kinds of ride-sharing apps, a lot of drivers got a job who were traditionally were not able to get a job because yellow taxis are limited, okay? Like same thing with airlines, because of the technology that allowed for uh, human like travel, um, a lot of people like stewardess, uh, pilots, and people who work in the airport, like those people all got a job. You know, these jobs are created. So, so what I'm saying is in technological unemployment, these two opposing forces are kind of like uh, fighting each other to, to um, see. So basically if substitution effect is greater, labor force participation rate is going to go down, right? Because um, jo more jobs are destroyed than created. If capitalization effect um, dominates, then more jobs are created than destroyed. Therefore, um, you will see increase in more jobs and our, your economy is able to um, employ more people in the population, okay? So uh, I'm gonna look, so we can just uh, look at the future and oh, this is gonna, this is what's gonna happen, but that's uh, just a speculation. But then if we have like, if you look at the history and what's what's been happening and see the trend, it becomes an educated guess. So let's look at the history. So 19th century, it's a continuation of first industrial revolution. What happened, so 19th century is like 1800s, you know, what happened there was um, water and like steam, like these things were invented and uh, people were, um, people who used to be artisans, like we talked about this in the introductory lecture, but people who used to be um, artisans who created a shoe, one man created the entire shoe.
Okay, but what happened in the 19th century is de de-skilling is what happened, it, which, which is specialization and simplification of tasks. So we think we, we, we usually correlate um, higher skill level with higher uh, employment capability, right? But then that's only a 20th century uh, thing. In the 19th century, uh, 21st century thing, 19th century, what happened was um, people who had a lot of skill, like our artisan, who had like knowledge and the skills to create one shoe from beginning to the end, actually had to de-skill. And they only uh, get, they get a job that only does the tasks of, of creating shoelaces only, basically. That's what de-skilling means. And through de-skilling, factory systems began to uh, replace artisan shops, shops and, um, uh, and people basically, people who were middle class, like people who are in the middle class by being an artisan became, came down in skill level and just work for uh, a factory, okay? But here, education was not necessary to find a new job. And actually more jobs were created because what used to be one man's job of creating shoes became 27 men's job. So instead of one man creating one thing, 27 people could create one thing. So um, there was high employment uh, it, it added more jobs, right? But then here in the 19th century, education was not necessary to find a new job because usually the labor uh, that was involved in, in factory working did not really require college education, right? All you got to do is just go to, the, the, go, to the, go to your job and just learn from either your supervisor or you know, your coworker or something like that. So, so here, only jobs were, I mean, jobs were created. Obviously, artisan jobs were destroyed, but more jobs were created through factory system. So in the 20th century, it was like second, you can call this second and third industrial revolution where electricity comes in, like in the second industrial revolution. And what electricity did like was electrification, we would say, it automated a lot of traditionally blue collar jobs. So for instance, like any job that didn't really require um, education that you was easily replaced by machines that were run by electricity. So what happened? So because of that, there was a lot of increased demand uh, of white collar jobs, like basically jobs that required some sort of education, like at least high school, right? So like clerk or filing clerks or bookkeeper, or a lot of, a lot of white collar jobs were in demand in this period in the 20th century. And here, what happens is the race between technology and education. So, so people like your parents, our grandparents, like they strive so hard to educate their children. Why? Because a lot of jobs were, you know, changing. Like the composition of the labor was changing from unskilled to skilled. So, so uh, in this era, what happened was a lot of jobs were, uh, a lot of blue collar jobs were automated, and white collar jobs were in demand, and we basically won the race between technology and education. What I mean by that is more people were educated than the pace of the technology. Okay. However, in the turn of the 21st century, um, you know, in the beginning, what happened was like dot-com bubble, you know, what that tells you is like, there has been crazy uh, speculation about this like tech industry, right? Here, like it flips, like, Back then, in the 19th century and 20th century, capitalization effect dominated, but in the 21st century, substitution effect starts dominating, right? It's because um, we can, there are many ways why um, it has been happening, but big data, as we saw from Xiao's lecture, big data and AI technology intruding non-routine cognitive and non-routine manual jobs. So um, big data plays an important role here because before when we, uh, we're talking about these like types of jobs. Uh, what was different about non-routine uh, jobs was it was really hard for coders to code every single situation, you know, manually. Oh, like when there's a car coming from the right, like it's a red car, then what you do is like press on the brake, like how, like this with this much strength. Like, it's, it's impossible to code everything. However, with the advent of big data, what allowed, um, 
was the sensor data um, and a lot uh, and improvements in sensor technology allowed for um, coders to not it didn't re it, it required it didn't require coders to code everything but just use the big data and using the processing processing uh, capacity of the computer to process it in the real time and just adjust to like different situations and right now as as we see here from 2000 to 2020 what we're seeing is um yeah we're losing the education and technology race um it's it's evident and and oh sorry so one thing that one, one pattern here that is uh, similar but at the same time different is in the 20th century, blue collar jobs were automated using electricity. But in the 21st century, um, sorry, like just disregard the last, just, just, oh, yeah, electrification automated blue collar jobs, but then AI and big data is automating blue and white collar jobs. Okay, so um, there has been a huge um, decrease in, in, in um, the availability of the economy to. Um, handle all the people, a uh, growing number of population. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. during, during your research, were you able to determine if um, that, that sloping um, uh, curve in labor participation uh, is temporary? Meaning, I, I get that technology will continue to progress Mm -hmm. But like, I'd, I'd have to imagine there's like some demographic forces at play here too. Like, the baby boomers are some of them still have to retiring. Work. Yeah, some of them still have to work because the retirement funds have been, been uh, funds have been decimated. Um, but but you know they can't they can't do what David Chow does at uh, uh, doing data science type of work. And so right. Um, do do you, do you feel like that that'll that'll tail off as as those baby boomers kind of leave? And then you have an entire generation of kids like Sharon and Chan Young and all these young people like coming back up or, or is this, is a longer term trend? Is it going to continue to expect it to continue to go down? So I think that's a very good question because um, it's really hard to predict the future. Um, but then what the consensus among the economists and also uh, the researchers is that the, the trend is, is due to the technology. Okay. Like, and, and um, oh, I think it's in the it's it's in the future slides. But then the trend is due to the technology, and there are other factors, as you've mentioned, the baby boomers are retiring, and and all these like people are kind of like not being able to um, adjust to the pace of the technology. But um, it depends on your belief. Like if you believe that technology is going to um, outrun, and it the if you believe in the exponential growth of the technology and the processing uh, power and the ability to um, kind of intrude into human labor, um, then the curve right here we're seeing from two and and here right here um, that's why I think this is important to uh, look at this this uh, portion because yeah. starting like 2016 there has been like stagnation of um, fall, right? And here, uh, a lot of it is due, a lot of it is um, due to highly educated uh, jobs being created for highly educated people. So for instance, like software engineers, um, like data scientists, uh, people who are like, you know, product managers and like those people who use like create creative um, grounds that machines cannot really, um, uh, get into yet yeah. like there was a huge job growth in those sec uh, sectors in the last like couple uh years yep. but if you see if you look at the un uh, high school um actually let me go to that slide right right now so if you look at this part right here this uh participation decline since great recession onset yep. um if you look at the college graduates it's very slow uh, very small like what this is like is this 2008 and this is 2015 yep. okay and uh the decline of the labor participation rate is really small uh between those seven year period mm. however some college gets bigger high school gets bigger 
And here, no degree, people with no degree is slightly less than high school. And that's probably because they already couldn't find jobs like uh -huh. starting, you know, 2000, uh, 2008. So maybe people already didn't have that many jobs and which means maybe people, there are not that many people to lose jobs in the first place. So, um, so that's a really good question. And I think that's something that we uh, have to keep our eyes on. You know, is this trend uh, going, uh-huh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I think I can add a perspective. This is also yeah. speculation. Uh, I think it's, it's not like jobs are gonna be gone. It, it, it's it's uh, right. for IR because of, you know, blockchain, we talk about it. I think new types of job will come out. Mm -hmm. and, and people like Chanyong or like Sharon, I don't know, like, or even the younger generations, they will be ended up doing jobs that we didn't even imagine before. And, you know, maybe that's kind of balance out because like data scientists wasn't a job, like even like 10 years ago or something, you know, like I, I feel like with all these uh, advancement comes with new definition of jobs. Like if you are a writer and then you decided to go on blockchain and and you can earn living earn tokens and you know you can be defined as employee like i i i feel like there are new types of jobs that's going to come out that's a that's a good perspective so as a, as uh, we we can go back to uh this part like every time there's a technological improvement uh, jobs are created and jobs are destroyed but what we need to uh analyze is which effect is going to be stronger. So if you look at the labor participation rate, it's in percentage, which means it depends on your, it depends on the adult population growth, okay? So in America, like uh, each couple uh, has a, like usually 2.2 babies, okay, on average. In Africa, it's like, like multiple of that number. So in America, this uh, job or labor participation rate might not be as pronounced as the global because in global, more people, uh, more, there could be more people every year, like new babies, newborn babies, than jobs that were cre created. Like, does that make sense? So, it, so labor participation rate depends on the population growth too. So if you have a lot of babies, like in Africa, you have a lot of babies, like each person has like 10 babies, each, each couple. But then the, amount, the number of jobs that are newly created is not the same, then labor participation rate is going to decline like very quickly. So in America, we have a pretty stable number of population growth and we have a pretty good um, technological growth or pretty good like, uh, uh, I guess, labor force participation rate because uh, there has been, or America has been the beneficiary of te recent technological advancements, therefore it created a lot of jobs for data scientists, um, uh, computer scientists, software engineers, uh, engineers, like all those kinds of jobs. But if you look at the global, um, global labor force participation rate, it's really pronounced and, and it's just headed downward. So whether this will curve up or down, uh, it depends on your belief, whether this artificial intelligence, blockchain, and robotics will create more jobs than the jobs that are destroyed by it, then um, it's going to go up. However, if you believe that uh, jobs, job uh, dis destruction effect is higher, then it's going to go down. And I personally think it's going to go down continuously and it's going to keep on its path. As um, our uh, population is uh, projected to be nine, 90 billion, Wait, 9 billion by 2030 or something like that as projected. So there is going to be huge population growth and whether we're going to create enough jobs for those people and also are they going to be educated enough to handle the really, really high tech jobs? That's also a question. Okay, so, um, sorry. So let's, oh, by the way, is there any other question? Uh, yeah, so, uh... I'm not sure if you, if you have this material covered, but uh, I believe that even though technological advancement will be really rapid as more fast than we imagine, but 
uh, there will be differences in the level of implementation, level of application. For example, for instance, like the countries of Africa, because of the lack of electricity or any other resources, they'll be much more slower in the application of the technology in their business. And I was wondering if that going to affect the like the labor force situation for each country and how much impact it will have on the global level. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's a good point because each country differs in how much they're going to implement and how fast they're going to implement, right? Uh, depending on the given resources that they have. And if the pace of implementation, like uh, adoption of the technology is faster, then the ability for the country to really educate their um, country as a whole, then uh, it's fine. However, if if it's the other way, if it's the otherwise, where uh, technology adoption is a lot faster than, um, I guess, given resources, uh, it's going to be difficult. So that's a good point. So uh, let me talk about, I guess, like a few points about how routine cognitive jobs are being replaced. Okay, so um, the three, there are three strengths that uh, machines have over humans. Um, why uh, these machines are replacing uh, human jobs in routine cognitive sector. Okay, so first is the scalability. So um, like we don't, so you see this picture here, but you don't even need that many supercomputers and data centers in order to tell that this is a lot faster in processing than hu a human brain is, right? So um, computers have like a major comparative advantage in data storing and processing, as we've seen like from uh, Xiao's lecture, and it has pattern recognition ability in big data setting, especially small data setting, humans are humans excel. For instance, like let's say, let's say we show Ellie 10 pictures of a dog when she's like, she was like two or three. Like she will see any kinds of dogs and in the world and tell you that it's a dog, right? She doesn't even need that many, many, like, you know, 10,000, 100,000 pictures in order to tell something is a dog. But in the big, large data setting, humans actually lack um, or humans actually lose on um, data processing and storing capacity against the, the machine. So scalability is a huge issue. And um, like, do you guys know this, like IBM's uh, Watson? Uh, technology. Yep. So what this is, is, oh, who said yes? Me, <laughs> but you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Watson um, basically provides chronic care and cancer patients, uh, cancer treatment diagnostics. So usually um, like medicine was of a doctor's job. Like when, when patient has like a symptom or has some sort of like illness, then doctor kind of evaluates this person's age and all kinds of different factors and, and tell you, oh, this is what you have. And therefore, because you have this kind of cancer, your treatment will be this. That's what doctors used to, used to do. But what, what, what IBM Watson is able to do is they read 600,000 medical reports and 1.5 million patient records and clinical trials. And using that like massive amount of data, to and, and also two million pages of text from medical journals. Okay, so they have all that memory. There's no doctor who can like instantly like remember everything that they learned in the medical school and tell you right away like, oh, this is what you have. Okay, but computers are able to do that and it's really fast. Also, and that's going to uh, reduce, I'm not, as, Xiao, as, as David Shao mentioned before, it's not gonna reduce ev uh, the number of doctors completely, but it's going to reduce the number of doctors because we don't, not that many people will require human contact. That was the only choice we had, but then now they have IBM Watson. And also um, there is this technology called Symantec Clearwell system. And what they do is they use language analysis and um, it, it's projected to get rid of all the paralegals um, and also uh, patent lawyers and contract lawyers because um, their main job can be easily replaced by this uh, Symantec, uh, uh, what was it called, Clearwell system. So they analyze, uh, they use the language data, like they read through all the text, they um, 
analyze it. And what they do is they can not only analyze the text data, but also sort. Like depending on like the categories, uh, what they did was um, it's actually capable of analyzing and sorting more than 70, no, 570,000 documents in two days. This is not a job that a human can do in two days, but you know, and that's what paralegals like and a lot of like uh, contract and patent lawyers do, and it can easily be replaced. Um, also, uh, sensing data, like, you know, this, like, if you see here, like we can easily sense like human face. Um, what this does is it's going to uh, get rid of all the CCTV operators, like the camera operators, um, product defect examiners, um, also intensive care clinical staff. Like this technology is going to make them redundant. Why? Because especially for clinical staff, all they do is when there is like a patient in the intensive care unit who has like some sort of like wrong uh, thing happening, for instance, like increased uh, blood pressure or increased like uh, heartbeat, what they do is they immediately like uh, report to the doctor and do whatever they can do, but uh, report to the doctor. But then that reporting, human doing the reporting is not necessary because um, the machine can do it. Uh, in California, I know a uh, Hong or, or, or a, a friend uh, in California, I think David knows him too. But what he does is basically um, he, using this AI and machine learning, um, it's basically sensing warehouse defects. So in the warehouse, usually what happens is like people go in and see like water, like how the temperature is, like how the, if there's like water leakage, if there is any like products that are like rotting or something like that. But then what the AI and sensory data and uh, sensors can do is they immediately detect like the problems. And also not only that, they can predict like when uh, you need to replace certain parts. Okay. So if, if like a battery life is two years, like it, it and, or like your battery is, is kind of like showing some sort of like uh, uh, fluctuation in it, it's like energy transmission. They can just immediately let you know, oh, this is what's happening. So you need to replace this part and stuff like that. Okay. So in the routine cognitive jobs, like this is um, really what's happening. And, and, and basically it's driven by AI, um, blockchain, uh, machine learning, and also in routine manual jobs, like because of coronavirus, like people, um, you know, you kind of are scared to get a coffee that's been made by a human person. But not now it's like, I, I guess like in people's mind, it's becoming more and more um, friendly, like machine created products are becoming more friendly and it's changing uh, like all kinds of things. And here, like one thing that is routine, oh shoot, it's non-routine, sorry change this non-routine oh my gosh i was tired okay so uh it, one thing that's like uh is going to be really a uh, defect is going to be dominant is driving so what so it's already being tested like since like years ago um and we we are about to see like auto drivers as long as like the obstacles are like legal obstacles are taken care of but if this automated driving takes place. There are 3.5 million professional truck drivers in America. And in 28 states, like that's the number one most, number one job in the 28, cent, 28 states, like truck driving. There are so many truck drivers in America and those people can easily be um, replaced. And it's cheaper. Um, and also these people, uh, there are a lot of accidents with truck driving because you drive for a long time, you get tired, uh, you have to take a rest and people don't really commit to the work hours that were suggested by the, the owners of the tri truck driving company. Those people can easily be replaced. 3.9 workers, there are 3.9 million workers in ride sharing services like Uber drivers, Lyft drivers. These people can easily um, be replaced. Uh, and, and, I, and I think this picture is, oh, Kind of shows oh i don't know what happened to the guy but there's a do you guys see 
Okay, there you there has to be a guy, one guy, like engineer who I, I think it's cut out. But uh, there's this one guy who overlooks at all kinds of like production uh, factory. Um, there's a pizza making robots and it's taking really fast. It, it's happening really fast. So, um, so this is as as you as you as we've been talking about like this. If you look at America, it's been flattening. But if you look at the the entire world, it's really pronounced. Uh, it's it's in a declining trajectory. And um, th these two are reports from IMF, and the driving forces of this uh, declining uh, labor shares is the technology and global integration, globalization, and especially so in uh, in advanced countries and China, or or, or in not including China. Sorry. Um, and. So here, what it means for a share of national income paid to workers has been declining. It means this. So there, are, so you, one nation earns the entire income, but then that income can be divided by a labor share of income and capital share of income. And the fact that uh, the labor share of income is declining means that capital share of income is increasing. Why? Because this is proportion, right? So this means a lot of business owners, like uh, factory owners or like these, people who are hiring workers are resorting to or, or transitioning from labor to, to um, capital, like machines. Like it's, it's very easily uh, seen, like if you look at the kiosk that's like happening, that's taking place everywhere in McDonald's and uh, it requiring less workers and also uh, in CVS or like other markets, like, you know, self, self checkouts. And these are things that we've been seeing, but then, what we saw in the past two here tells you that it's not just the cashiers or the kiosks that are in place. It's really the non-routine manual jobs that also can be destroyed. And manual jobs, okay? And those people, the problem is those people are usually not educated. So most people in the non, who are working in non-routine manual jobs are not educated. So how to educate these people to take on the jobs that are newly created, that's also a challenge. Okay, so um, that's the last part of my, um, and, and here uh, we, see, we, we talked about the, the disparity um, de depending on uh, your education level. And we're going to cover this uh, in the later part, like chapter five, when, I, when we talk about the inequality. <clears throat> okay, so question. So first uh, question I would like to pose is, knowledge is basically I know A, that, that's knowledge. But consciousness is I know or I am aware that I know A. So it seems like what differentiates humans from machines is consciousness. And if you have anything else, you th if you have anything else that you think um, uh, is there, then please share. Do you think this is helpful? If so, what could still be left for humans that machines cannot do? Because we've seen like a transition from automation of blue color jobs, like or starting from artisan jobs into automation. Now we've seen auto, uh, blue color jobs being automated by electrified machines. And now, in the 20th century, what we've seen, or 21st century, what we're seeing is even white color jobs, like the ones that use the cognitive capabilities to do the labor is being replaced. So what, what do you think is left for humans? Uh, yeah, so I believe that uh, humans will be still important. That means that they can uh, ask the question. So I believe uh, the ability to doubt, uh, the, even the like most um, obvious facts, is a is a kind is a will be kind of gift for the human beings. So, for example, like uh, till uh, till like five years or six years ago, we believed that Pluto belongs to the solar system, right? But there were, there were scientists who doubt that 
uh, Pluto is not enough to be to satisfy the standard of the planet. And those kind of small like adjustment to the facts or to the scientific information will eventually create a new perspective. And I believe that that's the part that AIs cannot, well, at least catch on on us that quick. And they will just have to adjust their data settings to the new perspectives that is presented by human beings. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like, um, I think, I think the, in order to question, um, you need to be aware, right? You need to be aware of what you know and you don't know. So um, when, when you said like uh, the ability for humans to continuously um, question, I think that's, that's a definitely an important aspect that we have that machines cannot do because machines, what they can't do is to form a question on their own. Like, okay, like there's a coronavirus, but like it is, it's probably, it, it probably knows that uh, coronavirus is taking place because it, that's like the headlines of the news and stuff like that. But then like how to solve coronavirus, like questions like this uh, cannot be just like automatically formed. So I, I do agree with that. I think it has something to do, I would want to add something. It has something to do with our creative mind. Um, of course, um, like we saw how AlphaGo um, advanced from, you know, um, having limited position into changing, um, creating kind of creating his own position and um, how he overcame that Korean, I forgot his name, Korean professional goal player. But um, one, yeah, one aspect or a trait that is still limited when it comes to computer, I believe that um, human has is that sense of creativity and our creative mind because computers and technology still needs some kind of data for them to process but for us we do have that kind of edge because that's god given so i believe that the direction of education in the future needs to be leaning on not the left brain jobs but on the right brain jobs that has something to do with creativity um only then will be able to um, expect humans to not just um, survive, but thrive in this um, yeah age. Like if you don't have something that's unique or because if you have the skills that robots and AI offers, then what makes you different? So we need to make the most of the creativity that we have. I yeah. think uh, um, the big thing is, another big thing addition to that is authority and what comes with it, liability. That, unless you're saying that will be given up to machines at some point, I don't think that will. And authority and liability come with a price. And that's something a human will always have to take, assuming we maintain status of being masters over the machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, one primary example of what Wen said was Einstein um, theorizing the theory of relativity. Like he didn't use, you know, um, big data in order to prove that something is true, right? In, 19, uh, in, the, in the 20th century, he used his imagination. He asked questions and he tried to formulate some sort of like theory within his mind in order to think that, oh, there must be theory of re relativity. And 100 years later, it has been proven by data. 
that it that his theory is true indeed right so that that i i definitely agree and um yeah so with uh what luke said um i think that's very true um unless i think so we we've seen a lot of like videos about uh like robots taking over the world um humans becoming slaves of the 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 robots and stuff like that but i personally think that that's impossible unless the robots uh we we can instill consciousness within robots as in like unless robots think oh wait i know i know that i know i know that i know um i need to kind of dominate this world I must dominate this world unless they think for themselves unless they can come up with some sort of with their conscious mind to have like uji like uh like will uh that's impossible and and that authority that Luke mentioned will always uh be like human domain unless we instill consciousness even figure out first of all like what consciousness means but instill that within the robots I, I think I think one one additional thing, and piggybacking on on what Wen said, I think um, there are like certain creative things. So especially within the realm of like arts, and music, and design, that that I feel like will will remain um, um, core to like humans, and it's something that differentiates them. Uh, but like not all of us are artists or or musicians or or designers. Um, but, but that's definitely one area. I, I think uh, to use a, a, a term that, you know, it's been coming from the pulpit, this idea of like leverage, right? And, and, and Pastor Yu talks about it from leveraging, you know, Christ and our identity and, and leveraging these things. But uh, um, if you listen to him, um, uh, he talks about practically leveraging the systems and things of this world um, to recreate and create something new. So uh, I think a prime example of that is like Elon Musk. Um, you know, the guy's like, he's like an engineer, but, but like he's, he's, not a, he's not a rocket scientist, but, but what he was able to do was leverage the technologies that were out there um, to kind of create a, a new product um, that, and, and create demand for that, and that's SpaceX. Is it the same thing with Tesla? He's doing it. <clears throat> with uh, his driverless cars as well. I think each and every one of us, we may not be the expert in, um, in blockchain or AI or, or, or any of these technologies, but within, within our respective fields, um, I, think, I think we can leverage that technology because it's becoming much more accessible for anybody to basically either learn it on their own, which is one of the reasons why I was talking about the Python class earlier, just pay somebody else. But but I, I think it's up to humans to kind of bring those things together, kind of see a problem, and then be able to kind of recreate um, and create a solution for, for those problems. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, I think that'll be within our realm going forward as well. Uh, to continue on that, um, so recently I shared with it uh, an article that says AIs are having difficulties with understanding Shakespeare. Because uh, as you know, like Shakespeare is like pinnacle of the English literature and they and it is built on the numerous metaphors and new words that that kind of doesn't make sense to well, but kind of makes sense right and uh, I saw I, I saw a video that says like one brain scientist explaining that uh, our brains are working really hard to comprehend the metaphor because those are the data that are outside the traditional box. They're outlier, outlier data. And those are the points that can be used as leverage against the AI because AIs are specialized in um, dealing with the standardized data while people are human being, human brain is capable of <clears throat> understanding outlier data. So I guess like they could be used in like if we, uh, by utilizing the outlier data, maybe we can find something new perspective that cannot be replaced by AI and maybe that could help to like uh, accelerate or increase the jobs created versus like jobs decreased like by finding new needs or new fields that 
the traditional traditionally did not know we need. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was another video that Chan Young shared, uh, which was about like the difference between like so we we've seen like how like deep neural network like AI can create music like new piece of music or but then uh, what what is different from human mind and deep neural network is that deep neural network has given nodes and with the given nodes they intensify the processes like that's happening the connections that's happening between uh, I guess neurals like more intensified version of like human neural activity but what humans are able to do that uh, deep neural network can't is to, as Eddie said, connect new dots. Like instead of just the given no uh, nodes, like creating another node to think about like a new connection. So um, that's something I wanted to share. Yeah. yeah, and I believe like that continues to the second question, like if it could be used for education for remnants because, mm -hmm. uh, well, just to dumb down for myself, I mean, I guess AI is one comprehend why humans are arguing about if the Earth is flat or not. And, uh, but there will be some, those kind of people who will ask, like, um, let's say stupid and untraditional questions, and we'll have to deal with those people because we have to educate them. And those will be points like, up to the new points of education like new forms of education or new like new types of teachers maybe that could also lead to the new job creation also but to development of the new methods of education for the younger generation i i think i think one um one key difference and and if if i were to ever talk with a remnant the advice that i would give to them is um if you look at the prior generation, and Kita, you know, he described this. Um, it's it's effectively division of labor, uh, but but um, back in the day, it was all about just specialize in one thing and become a become the absolute expert in like this one thing. So maybe it's just like just do this hammer, and as long as you do that, you can work in the factory, and and you'll have a job. Um, but given technology can easily replace those things in manufacturing processes. Uh, I actually think uh, important skill going forward uh, is going to be adaptability. And, and so if you think about a, a lot of the literature that's coming out around um, development of, of children and, and developing people and, and those people, even within companies that are the most successful, it's not the, um, it's not like if I were to use a football analogy, like if you have a center, the guy who just snaps the ball, all he does is snap the ball and he just does this. If you can do that the most efficiently and the fastest, boom, and this, then like, then he's an amazing center. And that's kind of the way that like, uh, we've been trained. Just be really, really good at that one job, but it'll eventually be replaced. And so the ability to, to have, uh, there's a book called Range. And what it, what it delves into is, is this idea of, of, people used to say, oh, like, you don't want to be a jack of all trades and master of none. You want to be a master of one trade because that's what'll, what'll help you like be the best. But I think, I think for remnants, because technology is moving so quickly, um, to be adaptable uh, is gonna be very, very important. It's, 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 one, of the, it's one of the key core tenets of, of actually the way that the military works, right? The military is not just about, we want the guy who could do the most push-ups or we, we want the girl who is the best like leader. It's about like creating the best athlete, right? This person that can like play any position. Uh, and, and, and I think increasingly, it's going to be important. Now, that doesn't mean you don't excel in anything. And that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't focus on something. You should absolutely focus on it. But I think being able to be adaptable, uh, to have a range um, of, of understanding and experience uh, is going to be increasingly important. Uh, for me, as an educator myself, um, one, well, you don't have to be jack of all trades, but you, there's need also to focus on um, one skill or talent that we have. But if I may give advice to our remnants, it is the importance of integration of skills. Um, of course, we know multiple intelligence that some people are 
intelligent in one area and not intelligent in the other area. But I believe that this is the age wherein um, people who have skills, multiple skills that can be um, integrated together will be very much needed in the future. So um, being able to integrate your skill, your skills together would be very beneficial in the future. So um, I believe that the direction of education, just like what I mentioned a while ago, should not be just leaning on the left brain um, education, but um, of course the right brain, but also um, being able to integrate those two. Yeah, I think uh, in my personal opinion, um, I was uh, forming with Jay Nuna on Sunday, I think, it, like the best way. So when I look at look back at my personal um, history or personal life when I was a child or when I was like in middle school or high school, um, maybe it's because I misunderstood uh, like the pastor's message, but I I thought just listening to the message uh, or drawing or or doing um, gospel message a gospel letter that that was enough, okay. But I think reading the word of God like and and making our students or our our remnants to really read the word because word itself is God and God is word. Is, so it it's just it, in the word it always makes us. What allows us to do is not, it, it gives us first, first and foremost, like gives us salvation if we believe and the way to salvation. But at the same time, it gives you to critically think. And I think you guys have mentioned like the way to connect like different things and also creativity, the realm of creativity. That's, that's only given to those who critically think and does not accept information as, it, as is and being brainwashed. And that's, that's like, if you accept information, whatever information you get it without processing it in your brain, it's brain, it's, you're being brainwashed. But if we read the word of God continuously, it, it makes us question, wait, I'm living for success. I'm living for the worldly pleasure, like better food, better apartment, better, whatever, more comfort and physical things. But do they really promise me happiness? Do they really promise me prosperity? And as we read the word of God, um, we start questioning, wow, wait, like we, we start questioning, wait, those things actually might not uh, give me the happiness. So in uh, religion studies, uh, apparently there is this term called uh, fetishism, which is you love the object for itself. So for instance, like love of money, like usually what, why you love money is because money gives you the ability to do something or buy something, right? But then you just love money so much for no reason. Like you don't even know why you want money. Like, like people say, oh, I want to get a lot of, I want to be, uh, I want to win lottery. But then they think about what they're going to do with the money after they get, um, they, after they win the lottery. So, so basically like this fetishism and like a lot of things that we think are going to give us happiness, we start questioning and in the word. and. I think it's a continual process. It's not just like the money, it's, it could be littlest things. And I think someone shared, I think it was Sharon, but it starts from like very small things, you know? And we, we start questioning everything within prayer. Wait, uh, is this really God desires? Like, is this, is this how Jesus would have acted? So um, I think for number two, that's, that's just my opinion. Like we need to kind of, help them um, be more creative, but uh, at the same time, like we have to create that environment. So, so I don't know if you guys remember, but we had this educator of professors, uh, professor of professors uh, to our YBOM meeting. Do you guys remember her? Like we had like this Zoom call. Yes. Yeah, 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 right, right. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I really got from that was the ability for remnants to critically think and how whatever they question about the word, we don't reproach them. Like, oh no, that's not the question you should ask. No, this is the question you should ask. Oh no, you should form like this. You should use these specific words. And we kind of like 
instill in the remnants like our method and and systemized way of learning but i what i think is we need to create an environment for remnants to freely share their opinion and not reproach reproof reproof or punish them for for certain opinions but really find the answers together in the word of god together so if they ask like oh why did god create uh the the tree of knowledge of of good and evil like usually we say oh like you know you you'll find out or uh oh, because god is absolute and he can do whatever he wants but I think this is something that we can explore together and that could be an opportunity for us young business people to interact with remnants also. So um, that's one thing that I wanted to share. Yeah. And Sharon, did um, you have a question? Sorry. Oh, it was answered. Um, oh, it was but, answered. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, actually my question was like, um, obviously, like it's evident that education isn't able to keep up with the technology right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, like it was just a question along that. And then, um, when you went to the next slide, which is this current slide, it was basically this, um, question number one and number two, but I guess, um, in response to these questions as well, I feel like, um, like the one thing that we have is free will, like true free will not like our decision that is influenced by other you know um mass advertisement and all these companies and data and um like just information that we just took in as you said but very we have free will that we can choose based on our objectivity and subjectivity and the standard of that must be the word of god and um like in educating our future remnants, kind of like really adding on to what um, Kite was just saying, I feel like remnants are often criticized and um, really like scrutinized for their interests from the smallest to the biggest thing. We say like, oh, that's not really Christian or that's not really what God desires. But oftentimes in that way, we be like, I feel like from a very young age, we begin to belittle the small interests and the small things that God has given to us. And because of that, when we like grow up, we begin to belittle the small ministry that God has entrusted to us and the small devotion that only we can give to God for God's works. And um, in that way, like, I don't know, I feel like it's really important for us to really incorporate healing to education because children, they're um, like too be educated and to learn something like they really have to see and hear and understand and communicate in a way that is and that requires a lot of healing too you know especially for children who are unseen unheard like neglected and isolated they don't really know how to communicate and they don't it really poses a great like socio-emotional obstacle in learning and so I feel like um, really to tap into that creativity that God has given to us and to, you know, be able to like use our subjectivity and objectivity that is grounded on the word of God. We really need this education that is systematized, but also incorporate like that is um, centered on healing. Um, and. Oh, wow. Like this is. <sighs> Like when we say, how can we utilize this in educating our future remnants? Like when you pose that question, what did you have in mind? When you say future remnants, who do you have in mind? So um, as young business, anyone who we cater to, like the future re generation, um, like growing up kids, um, it could be college students, um, it mm -hmm. could be uh, high school students, middle school, elementary, kindergarten yeah so like if we kind of expand the definition of remnants to like any remnants in the 237 nations if we really think about like the remnants who will like the scattered ones in all yeah, definitely nations mm -hmm. i feel like um like it's really important for us to also think about how um our small ministry and the small thing that god has entrusted to us 
could be also scaled globally. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah so as we saw, like well, one of the uh, case studies, um, mm -hmm. the new fundamental technology like blockchain and AI, it's not, it's not going to only benefit just like, the developed nations. It's gonna have impact in like global, uh, scale, on a global scale. So um, using those kinds of platforms, like as remnants and as young business people, how can we utilize these globally impactful um, technologies in order to um, kind of have interest in those remnants, as you said, like who are scattered and how can we help them? Like even with Zoom, I think, um, I've been reaching out to uh, a few remnants who used to be in upstate New York that I met in um, uh, at the RCA, but they, they um they're just completely isolated you know mm. they're just and eat their remnants but they still feel isolated but what if they're their remnants in like a different country where there's like no system like you know so that's something that we should definitely think about yeah great hey, just a silly question like stupid question do you think um we're going to eventually pay extra money for human services? Oh, like counseling or? No, no just like, uh, for example, like uh, robot barista versus human barista and you pay extra money just to receive coffee from a human barista. Possible, definitely, like, because we innately want human interaction. I think we, one day if everything is replaced, uh, by robots and there are people who are going to be reminiscent of what used to be like i think so that's possible yeah. basically and and, and economically be. speaking like in economic theoretically speaking uh -huh. um if there's a a relative if if the relative price of one factor for instance like labor and it, it if it decreases then um or not the sorry, not the price. If the relative share of one factor decreases, then the price of that increases. The, so the price of labor is what? Wage, right? And if the relative share of human labor with respect to machines decline like very steeply, then humans who are still working in that environment become scarce. So their price goes up. So their wage must go up. So in that, that sense, that's possible, but yeah, we don't, we never know. But that's an interesting question. So if, is there any other uh, opinion about number one or two? Um, I have. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Assistant pastor. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. So like when I um, think about the uh, number two questions and uh, how to um, to utilize this in educating our official remnants, um, actually, like those technology, like like Eddie, as Eddie mentioned, like Elon Musk, like he, um, of course, the Steve Jobs, like Elon Musk, they're like they're born smart, but but other than that, like they have their own ide ideology that like they want to change their own their world. So I think they, uh, I think everything like the create creation is starting from the like the, the one person's ideology. So. I think the most important thing we need to teach the remnant is uh, the correct worldview. So like since since like, or well, I mean like when I, when I was young, like my teacher, like teacher like said like, this is what do you want to be? What's your dream? And then uh, I want to be, a, I said, I want to be a cop or I want to be a doctor or something like that. But nowadays, or oh, when I ask the younger, gen, young, young, like the children and then what is your dream? And then some people say, I want to be a YouTuber and I want to be something. So like it depending on the technology, like they, <clears throat> like the children dreams are like the change as well. So the one thing we really need to um, teach is on like the correct worldview as, as Gita mentioned, like through the Bible, we really need to teach it because, <clears throat> but like, I think um, the most important thing is like, we really need to teach the we, to the remnant that like uh, how the Holy Spirit works to you. So like even even like the um, da like data and like the big data cannot understand how the Joseph became a, like the governor like it's it's totally it's impossible even and then also like the the meeting 
더, 더, 그, 필립 과데시, 필립은, 에, 베트네이링, also, it's also the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So, I think, it's, it's all like, every, like, the creativity things is, is coming from the, like, the, when the Holy Spirit works. So, so we really need, need to, to teach the remnant that, like, on, of course, we need to learn, like, those, the word things as, as well, but, um, but when, the, um, but the most important thing is like we really um, need the Holy need the Holy Spirit works. So yeah, that was that was my like thoughts about the, the question number two and the um was, yeah that was it. I, I forgot one one more thing, but yeah, I forgot one more. I, I forgot one thing. So yeah, that's it. If you remember, please let us know. <laughs> Okay, um, so we can go to number three. So we're expecting an unprecedented spike in unemployment in the near future, not because of coronavirus, but there are a lot of things that are coming. So, um, and, and the, the front page of the, this week's um, The Economist magazine was the debt after coronavirus. Okay, so there are a lot of things that will be happening and um, there will be a lot of church members and churches that will be affected by it. However, meanwhile, God gave us Acts 2, 44, 47, which sheds light to an ideal and biblical economy. So I wanted to ask like what your definition of the economy of light is and what your action plan and resolution before God to help struggling church members and dependent churches as YBOM members. So if you uh, haven't, so just in case, so we can remind ourselves, Acts 2, 44, this is my vision of like, um, this is God's vision of of the true economy, and it says, "All and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food and glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." So um, I was maybe this, I was thinking maybe this could, time could be the time where we share our um, definition of the economy of light and also like what our action plans are. And I think it goes well with uh, not only today's message, but also the prayer journal messages because there are a lot of dependent churches. Um, <clears throat> So I, um, I, I can start and, and I think this should just be an open discussion. Um, I, I, think, I think this is, this is one of the, the primary spiritual battles that we have to engage in. I think, I think raising remnants and everybody, everybody that's here is involved in, in the remnant movement. I see all you guys at Remnant Day and, and for me, that's kind of like the baseline. I think that's a given. I think given, given folks here, um, you know, earn a living or will soon start earning a living. Um, um, this is the small devotion, um, not, in, not in an abstract way, like my small devotion is I'm gonna do my three, two days or my small devotion is I'm gonna pray. Like, let's be real, that's, that's the foundation. You, you should be doing that. I think, I think um, this is what we need to challenge towards. This is, going back to last week's business message, um, the, the field that's that's in the most desperate crisis, uh, where nobody else wants to go. I think this is what we need to challenge to, and, and we need to figure out how to do that. One of the things that, that I wanted to share separately with with um, the um, the white bomb leaders in in our region, uh, but I'll bring it up here. I think one way that we could actually actualize this um, and actualize today's business message. Is uh, is are the funds that we've raised um, for uh, for NAVEC and for Remnant Enterprise? Hang on one second. Um, and, and it's it's um, we have like twenty thousand um, dollars. I was gonna ask Sharon to reach out to our donors, um, and I've I've asked Hunjin and Che before, like. 
the dependent churches in our region, right? Uh, it's one thing to say, hey, we want to be Obadiah, we want to be Obadiah, but, but I think one way we can actualize that is these funds that we've raised, why don't we use a portion of that and disperse that um, to, to, to the pastors and evangelists in our region that, that may not, um, that may be struggling even more so, they may not have access to government funding, um, I think this is one way that we as young business people can, can do that. And, and, you know, there's complications. I, I, this passage, Acts 2.44, I think that's, that's the first century church, and that's what we all aspire to. Um, but but um, until we get there, um, um, I think we need to figure out what that system looks like. And so um, that's one way I, I think we could practically try to actualize it. I think the other longer term way is is uh, incubating and, and growing uh, remnant enterprises and and it, it requires uh, each one of us to to take that uh, message to our hearts uh, to see how we can do it within our respective fields whether it's design or education <clears throat> or finance or funding or real estate there has to be a way there has to be that god-given covenant just to me um that, that we can recreate uh, and, and actualize this. So, so that, those are my general thoughts, but, but like, um, again, going back to what Keita shared earlier during this forum, faith in action, um, you know, sorry for sounding harsh, but everything that we talked about, we should be doing anyways. I, I feel like we need to challenge towards what, what others are not doing. I, uh, I have a boss who is Mormon and I asked him because my, pa my senior pastor told me to ask them, how, how does the Mormon church handle offering? And it eventually evolved into discussion on how exactly the Mormon church came to be so wealthy. Uh, in, in, the D in the DC area, we have the infamous Mormon temple with the golden statue on it and it's a real testament to that it's like it's like there it looks like disneyland and you every time you drive on the major highway you have no choice but to look at it um basically you know i don't know how long this will last and i don't know how exactly uh this you know blockchain and digital currency will change this but and the and the concept of things they have accrued enough wealth that they that their investments just is self-sustaining and you know i'm i'm not in the crowd of people who don't understand this so i'm not going to explain any of that um but even for our church i don't really think it's too personal but every month it it takes about 15 16k to support it and I mean, it's a small church. Our church is small, so maybe that's unrealistic, but I, we're not a dependent church. And if it only takes that much, and if someone has passive income, legit passive income, and give it to the church of something that brings in, you know, 200K a year, this this thing that was said in the pulpit message uh financial freedom I, I can't get my mind off of that I, I i think i have to study a bit more on how exactly that, that works because like my father tells me like he's a salary man and he makes he makes money but i looked at his tax and like literally half his income disappears because of tax and it's it's insane so but he said you know as it is now, the if you were a business with how the law is written, like you don't have to, you have more control of this than I do, Luke. And I'm like, okay. So there's something there um, which I don't understand as an engineer, as a, as a simple like you know, I'm just I'm just a guy in the military who happy to have a job, so. You know, the, 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 on the Mormon church, that's an interesting point because there was an article in the Wall Street Journal on it. The way they started was, I want to say, like 30 or 40 years ago, um, they started with basically Acts 244. Now, they have their own Bible, but basically that's what they did. They, they, everybody 
came together and and they tied and they gave offering and you're right they um they basically gave and shared everything in common and then to your point they started with a billion dollars and then they raised their version of the remnants if you look at a guy like Mitt Romney who's a very devout Mormon um, they raised them up to become an elite and then he was a partner at Bain Capital and he's probably one of the guys that gave a hundred couple hundred millions of dollars to that endowment and they continued to invest in and grow it I like we, we don't talk about this but like this is what's this is what uh, needs to be talked about and, and, and the system pastor you just tells the elders you got the system and 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 um we, this, we need to talk about this and so it's time that that we as young business people talk about it but that's really what it was they they took their their version of the bible held on to that um and started but it but it took 30 or 40 years and i think that's the reason why pastor you, you for this this year's message she's looking at the next 30 years and, and i think I think we have to play play an active role in that, and, and it's either in in developing businesses for that, it's in raising remnants that can support that. Um, it's it's all aspects of it, but but that's how they started. They started very very small. Yeah, because the way I see it, um, Mormons have congregations even in the same location, and they give their tithe, but it, it seemed that a lot of their support did come from the big mormon church and it it just there's this, there's this trickle down of money to those places so it, again it didn't seem like they were dependent because i think they're all one church because they're mormons um but what i was uh thinking about was i mean yeah that that's the only point i wanted to make Thank you. Yeah. yeah so I, I I share this with other church officers outside of our region, and like the the church officers that are focused on this, um, like like we're all ashamed because when when we see them, um, the their their stated purpose is this: they basically raise a hundred billion dollars, and you know what they said? They said we're waiting for disasters, and that's when we're going to deploy this money to do evangelism. Like that's their strategy. And so um, the church officers that are in the flow, um, their response is like, we're, they're just so ashamed. They're like, what are we doing? What are we doing right now? Um, and, and I think it's incumbent, it's incumbent upon us um, to like, this like, even like idea of oneness is like, it's like, oh, like we need oneness. That's a given. We need to have oneness. Um, all these things I feel like are a given. I feel like, this is the flow of the world. These are what the other organizations are doing. And we have 30 years starting today uh, to prepare for that. Definitely. I think even James says like, what, like the action, if you have faith, action must follow. And action is what, you know, gives you righteousness. There's no way, like you, you have faith, but you don't act. Like, how can you say that you have faith? I think that's what he's saying. And, and I think it really starts from like small things and small resolutions of like business, young business people. But, and even in the Bible, it says where the treasure is, your heart is. And um, we can say all day long that, oh yeah, that's where my heart is. But if your treasure is not there, then can you say that your heart is there? So. Um, I think it's important for all of us to um, really go back to the word and um, like practice. I think at the end of CVDIP, like that's practice. Like, you know, you have the covenant, you have the image, the dream, you see what's happening in the world and you see the disasters coming and you know how, how sh should, um, what, what's, what's going to happen. But at the end, like you, you need to practice. So I think um, if, Nobody else has any comment. I think I went way over. I apologize. I'll try to be more mindful next time. But um, thank you so much for coming or, or tuning in. And next next lecture, I will cover a little bit of social impact, but it will be mainly um, the universal basic income and also cashless society, uh, how, how we're heading towards it and also inequality as a result of that.
So, Wait, are you going to be talking about like policy recommendations as well, or like something along the lines of like for um, civilizations or like places where they can't afford the infrastructure for technology? Like, what happens to that inequality? Um, I wasn't planning to, but uh, I'll I'll try to prepare. <laughs> Thank you. So I was I was mainly going to talk about universal basic income. Um, okay. And and. Um, I'll see if I can include that as well. Uh, if you have any research that you've done before, uh, it will really, really help um, if you send me over. Cool. Or you can take like maybe like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to um, take my time to kind of present. That's totally fine with me as well. Yeah. Because like what happens to places that can't afford this technology, like it doesn't right. have access to this. Because mm -hmm. like we even see it in our, um, in my college, like online classes, there are some people who if they turn on their cameras, their entire Zoom just shuts down. And there are some people who don't, who can't access Zoom, even, the, even if they're in the same time zone because their family only has one laptop. Mm -hmm. Even in America, right? Yeah, Yeah, even at NYU. Mm. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so right. much. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.